the Battle of the Way was part of the Ten Offensive. It lasted from January 31st, 1968 to, to around March 25th, 1968. On March 31st, 1980, the President, okay, the evening of Sunday, March 31st, 1968, I was riding in a car with some other Columbia SDSers returning from my first national SDS meeting in Lexington, Kentucky. The debates over SDS's future program and direction had been chaotic. With my anarchist friends from the Lower East Side, the motherfuckers, here's Ben Morea, the Evergreen motherfucker, disrupting every speech they didn't like with the cry, that's bullshit and you know it. But I was still euphoric from hanging out with SDS members I had not known from other chapters around the country. We were outside Cincinnati when the radio blared LBJ's historic message. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. We stopped the car, whooping and hollering, hugging each other and dancing on the side of the road. Victory! We had done it! The anti-war movement had forced a sitting president to abdicate and seek peace. Johnson had agreed to call a limited bombing halt and to begin talks with the Vietnamese. Now, of course, it took seven more years until the war was over, and I read about that. Yeah. Right? And that's, a, that's an important fact, but still, we forgot the fact that we had forced them out of office. And the anti-war movement did help end the war. Four days later, on April 4th, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. He was there helping sanitation workers who were on strike to force the city to recognize their union. Black garbage collectors, supervised by whites in a southern city, had endured abysmal conditions and pay. In King's view, the question of poverty was as much a civil rights issue as the right to vote or eat at a lunch counter. In response to the assassination, black ghettos in almost 100 cities and towns around the country went up in flame, including Harlem, right beside Columbia. Standing across from Columbia President Grayson Kirk's mansion at the corner of Morningside Drive and West 116th Street, JJ and I looked out over Harlem as dust fell that unseasonably warm early April night. Below, we could see the flames of dozens of fires, dark smoke clouds trailing upward. In the distance, we heard the shrieks of a fire and ambulance sirens, and rising above that, the roar of a sound I've never heard before or since, the wailing of the hundreds of thousands of people of Harlem, the capital of black America. JJ and I looked at each other, and both of us said the same words at the same time. Let's go. We tore down the broken steps that descended through untended, garbage-strewn Morningside Park, the no-man's land between the heights and Harlem. Wandering around Harlem most of the night, we watched people loot TVs and stereos from appliance stores, face down lines of beleaguered cops, set up improvised barricades of garbage cans to block the fire engines. Burn, baby, burn, seemed to be the message. Along the way, many concerned black people warned us that it wasn't safe for whites on the street. Yet we were never once threatened. Strangely, we saw an anarchic joy of release in some people's faces, mixed with the rage. Others were standing around crying, while still others were dancing in the streets as Martha and the Vandellas sang. After a few hours, JJ and I got separated, and I wandered around alone, invisible, drinking it all in. Malcolm X, assassinated more than three years before, was alive that night on the streets of Harlem. 
I saw them. For the next few days, the atmosphere at Columbia mirrored the intensity of the world outside. Every conversation had to do with the persistence of racism in society and in our own lives. This was when many people in Columbia first became aware of the fact that the university planned to build an 11-story gym in Morningside Park. 